Welcome, precious one, to Time with Archbishop Charles. Beloved, like I've said in earlier episodes, this is my 40th year in ministry and also 40 years in a miracle ministry. And in 40 years, you meet a lot of people. Some of them you bless, some of them they bless you, some of them you hurt, some of them they hurt you, some of them they become reliable people. You can call them in the middle of the night and they will be there. Um, today I'm going to interview, he's a young man um, because I'm some years older than him, so I bully him with my age and all that. Uh, but he's done tremendously well and I've known him. Anytime I've called upon him, night or day, he's been there to stand with me. This person is no other than Bishop Gideon Yofi Titiofe. Bishop Titiofe, welcome to Time with Archbishop Charles. Thank you, Archbishop. It's a great honor to be hosted by you, and um, I feel very blessed to be here. Amen. Um, <coughs> for somebody watching <coughs> who doesn't know Bishop Titiofe, can you in brief tell us about who Bishop Titiofe is? Well, so I come from a family of priests. My father was a Methodist priest mm -hmm. and a superintendent minister of the Methodist Church from Mount Point Kapim. He was also a teacher, okay. and he was teaching Bible knowledge in Takwa Secondary School. Wow. When, that was when I was born, and he was teaching on the story of Gideon, and he told my mom that if you if your child is a boy, I'll call him Gideon. Okay. So I've come from that family. Also a family of educators. Like, okay. So he was a priest. At the same time, I was also the manager of Methodist schools. Okay. And I have siblings who are also mm -hmm. educators uh, as, as, as well. Um, I got born again in 1982. I was then 14 years old. And uh, there was a revival in the... Uh, late 60s through the 70s and then early 80s and I got caught up in that revival the movement around uh, the scripture unions and the fellowships around the f community parks and all those things were things that helped with my spiritual for spiritual formation got into the ministry when I was 22 in 1990 and uh, got married when I was 24 in 1992 and my wife and I recently celebrated our 30th and, yes. uh, in May, and you were graciously <laughs> there to bless us and helped us to renew our vows. vows. Um, I have four children with my wife. We, in addition to pastoring the Pleasant Place Church, we also run a number of I have four children with your wife. Do you have some with any other wife? No. <laughs> We're the only <laughs> wife I have. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Um, yeah, in addition to pastoring the Pleasant Place Church, okay. we also um, run a multiple educational institutions. We have the Temple Christian International School, mm -hmm. which is a secondary school founded by my wife to help create um, a Christian environment out of the home for Christian children. So that we, she realized that most Christian parents are doing very well to try to create a Christian environment at home for their children. But when the children leave home and they go to school, they don't get the same ambience and environment for them. So she decided to create this school and they're doing very well. And then I also oversee the Accra Business School um, as well. So in a nutshell, that is... Wow, the Accra uh, Business yeah. School is, is a testimony and is doing great things. I started in 2004 with a borrowed 500 Ghana cities from a friend. At that time, I think it was around $100 or $250 and uh, did my first conference. When I finished, I had made a profit of 1,600. While having taken out the 500 for my friend, I made a profit of 1,600 and started with it. And today we are a multi-million dollar um, institution. We are predominantly a graduate school and uh, I look at myself more like an educational evangelist and use education to impart a lot of people, to exalt Christ Jesus, evangelize the lost, and edify the saved. Wow. Awesome, awesome, <laughs> awesome. Hey, this is your utterance. <laughs> okay, Bishop Titi. Can you, when, when, when did our paths cross? I have followed you over the years when we do not even have... Um, 
Facebook and other things, within my circles as a growing believer, I had heard of the exploits the Lord was using you to do in Tamale, but I hadn't met you until when I was passing a church in Odoko and you had moved around to circle and the tremendous work that was going on in Kwame Nkrumah's circle was amazing. What a very unique revival that was led by you. Um, proud to that, most miracles that are taking place are taking place on crusade grounds and other things. But for the first time, for me, I was seeing a church service was characterized by explosive, explosion of miracles and testimonies, especially the afternoon sessions. Yeah. So I used to come around yeah, and sit at the back service, there to yeah. flow with the service and tap into the oil and tap into the anointing. And the genuineness of heart, the humility with which you approached what God was doing with your life because it was so unique. It was so unique with what God was doing in your life and your accessibility. The ever-increasing smiles of yours that draw people to you was amazing. So that was where I started having an impact from your ministry. And then we really started getting together, meeting each other when I moved to the Spinters Road and started the Sheepfold Chapel, which is now a Pleasant Place Church. And you graciously accepted to speak for us and also invited me to join you on the campaign for the youth explosion. And that really was what I felt this really is a man that needs to be celebrated because with everything God has done with you, the church you have, the crusades from Pakistan to predominantly Islamic countries and what God, the thousands of people that you were affecting, the, the invitations around the world, the Maurice Arullo's platform around the world, and you still will make time for young people. And I started my ministry as a youth pastor, and I really still feel I am a youth pastor. I feel I don't have message for older people, but for younger people. And so to see you do that, was something that really connected me to you. For the last 20 years, I have followed your ministry. I have gotten connected to you. We have been very close. And I must say that what I saw outside is the same thing I'm seeing inside. You know where many people, their public appearance is different from their private life. For you, it is the same. And that is one of the things that I truly appreciate about you. And you have become a face of integrity for the charismatic movement, not only in this country, across Africa and beyond. Mm. Wow, that, that's an awesome responsibility. <laughs> it is, it is. I it mean, is. you are not the it only is. one who says that, but I think the first time I heard that was from my dear friend, Bishop Imakando. Mm. And, I, you know, I mean, I, yeah. it was like, hey, so people are watching what we mm. do. Mm. So it means that... Um, what we do and say and how we organize our lives people are observing people are observing i enjoyed our journeys together youth explosion um can you say a little bit more about youth explosion and how it impacted the youth i'll share this testimony so the kumasi edition of the youth explosion um after several years after that event in kumasi i had gone to speak for dr vitor say okay and there was a young man in the church who said he was going to drive me around town whilst I was in Kumasi. But I had gone with a team. And my protocol team would not allow him to drive. But this guy had taken off. I stayed for one week. had taken off from work. And he would come and park his car in the morning at my hotel. And then any time we were moving, he was driving following behind us. He was following us. So one morning when I got down, I saw him. I told my protocol team, you know something? Let, let this guy drive me. I don't know why he wants to drive me. But I, so I went to this guy, asked my people not to join me. I sat in front with him, with him alone. And then he said, Bishop, I want to tell you something. You know, when I heard you were coming to Youth Explosion, I came and I heard you speak. He said that he had then decided that he was going to commit suicide mm. because he had just completed the university. He had, he had no job heard about the youth explosion you were coming, came listening to you, how you imparted him and all those things and heard the day I was going to come. So he also came just to listen. 
And he said, as a result of the youth explosion, he changed his mind about committing suicide. At the time of driving me, he had become a general manager of a security company. Wow. And he felt that it was as a result of the tremendous impact of the youth explosion. And I've met a few pastors and young people who have come to our under 40 programs. Mm. And they say, oh, the first time we saw you at the youth explosion. And they are in, in their numbers, in their hundreds. Mm. And we sit down, we talk about the impact of the youth explosion, how it helped young people to define their mission, developed a vision for themselves, helped young people to determine their deadlines in life, set their objectives, helped young people to defend their values and devise their strategies in life. And, and youth explosion was a big sacrifice to me. It was. Because we did the meetings and <laughs> most of the monies came from me. Yeah. And those of you who spoke for me, I told you from the beginning I wasn't going to give you an honorarium. And you paid your own fuel also to the place. Um, <laughs> recently, I had to go and do uh, um, a, a scan or mm. an x-ray mm. um, in one of the laboratories. And I got there and uh, I was in my face mask. So when I took off my face mask, the radiologist started jumping, screaming, mm. hey, Archbishop, you are here. Mm. I said, what's happening? She said, look, I was in youth explosion. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, 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 I mean, she made my day. <laughs> you know, she made my day. But, but we had to make sacrifices yeah. for youth explosion to yeah. come to play, yeah. to, to be. And mm. we went around this country with it. Tamale, yeah. Kumase, mm -hmm. etc. You know, God. And looking at the fact that at the time, um, social media was not as no. big as this. Mm. Imagine if youth explosion it's running at this time. Mm. You could, the impact <laughs> would have been greater yeah. and stronger. But mm. even with our limited um, media yeah. avenues, yes. the impact was huge. I mean, conference halls were back to capacity. You know, and the amazing thing, is the sacrificial attitude that you put out there, you didn't do it in your church. You, even in um, cities where you had branches who could host it, you decided to hold it in neutral places. It, it, it was more or less like it belonged to the body of Christ, and that was quite commendable. I, I believe that God used it to revive the youth ministries in various churches. I agree. Because after our period with youth explosion, I began to see now very impactful youth, you know, movements, uh, movements in mm. the various churches. And so... Yes, I'm glad it happened. So most of the young people <laughs> that came in became like fire snatched from, um, a fire a stick snatched from the fire. Yeah. It's just like what used to happen in the villages where one woman starts a fire and another woman in the neighboring house comes to pick one stick and goes to start a fire. And the next woman also comes to speak the same stick to start a fire. So most of the young people that came to youth explosion were like sticks that were snatched from the fire and went out there and started other fires. And I think that that was a great work you did. And uh, if God tells you again to do youth explosion again, we'll be there to support that work. Amen. Amen. We know one another. We, 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 you know, we've gone closely. Um, if you were to talk to the youth about what you know has made my ministry what it is, what will you say? I, I, I want to look at you from, for, for me, everything I do is leadership. Okay. And I look at you from that leadership perspective. First and foremost, I want to agree with Maurice Cerullo when he said about you that in very real occasions, will you find a man who flows in all the five Ford ministry? Ford ministry. And I have seen that. For instance, at the apostolic level, they are, from a leadership perspective, there are three things every apostle must do. The apostle should be able to grow the leader in him, grow the leaders around him, and grow the organization that he leads, which is the church. I have seen you as an individual growing yourself 
it amazes me to see how you commit time to your self-development. It's like you are not satisfied with who you are. And I can tell, listening to you and watching you from, from circle days up to now, watching you when you were on TV3 and other TV stations on Saturday mornings and some Saturday afternoons and all those things, seeing how you have grown yourself and developed yourself. I have seen how you have been able to discover your own developmental needs and have created time to develop yourself and build yourself. I think that your ability to grow yourself in order to be able to meet the needs of your ministry is one of the things that every leader, every young person must be able to learn from you. It's amazing. You've grown yourself from a young man in Tamale into a statesman and a global leadership icon, a global evangelist. It's an amazing thing for one man to be able to do that. You have been able to transition very well. As the seasons are changing, you transition. So you haven't become irrelevant. You are not even relevant. You are actually revolutionary. Only few leaders are able to move from being relevant into becoming revolutionary. Because now people, you are no longer sharing information. You are now an inspiration. People look at you and they see beyond your sermon. They see an inspiration. And that is amazing. I think that's one of the things young people, when they look at you, should be able to look at how you have developed yourself. You have grown yourself. The second thing is your capacity to grow the people around you. The establishment of the word Miracle Bible School is I sent a number of our young pastors when we were starting our church to the place and seeing that transformation. Today, they pastor some of our fastest growing churches, you know, and seeing that two years they spent in that school and the impact on their lives was amazing. Your school has graduated a lot of, a lot of young pastors who are making impact around the world. And the testament to your capacity and ability to grow the people around you. The recent charismatic ministered network that you have launched and the hundreds of churches who, that you have planted and um, also the hundreds of churches that are networked and look up to you as the father. It's amazing to see that the young people, people who come to your church as ushers, as youth leaders, becoming bishop under you. It's a, it's a testament to how you are committed to not only growing yourself, but growing the people around you. The other thing is about growing organizations. And look at what you have done with the Paris Chapel. And it's one of the most respected churches around the world. And in Ghana, it's, it's, a, it's a church that is very much respected and honored. I'm assuming you are the first person to build a dome as a chapel in this country. And they become a standard by which others are following. And those who are building it, they are not building it because they want to compete. They are building it because you are a standard so bearer. Yeah. It's something that they feel that if, as Bishop Ajinasari has done it, let us do it. And it's quite Re remarkable your ability to grow and to grow the things around you is something i believe that young people should be able to look at you and develop themselves in terms of your calling into the prophetic office you, you, you see there are apostolic prophets and there are prophets that occupy that office of the prophets they would like to close their eyes and see demons and see other things but you are an apostolic prophet, and as an apostolic prophet, you speak to governmental leaders. I've seen how you address crisis when they come into this country. The boldness with which you stand in your church, and your constituent is bigger than any political party. And you are not concerned about who is offended, who will understand you, once you feel that there's something that needs to be addressed. And that a speaks of the level of prophetic office that you occupy. Speaking to governmental leaders is an amazing thing. And who doesn't know your evangelistic office and the things that you do? I remember speaking to a, a former deputy governor of Bank of Ghana who was herself a diplomat to a number of countries uh, in Europe. And um, when she realized I had a relationship with you, I went to visit her and she was watching um, 
a, a video of you in Pakistan. Then when I got there, he just said, ah, look, I'm watching your father's thing. Now, how, why is this man making this happen? And the way he spoke, he said, listen, people do crusades, but I've never seen a black man, not even a white man, having this number of people in an Islamic country. So he's there. Your combination of the pastoral and teaching ministry, your capacity to have a seat at the Paris Dome, Jowolu, and to teach consistently and pastor consistently over these years. I tell people that when you go for lectures, to sit under one lecturer for three hours, sometimes it's like a torment. But you have had people that have sat under you for over 30 years and will still run to church. It's an attestation of how well rounded your ministry is. And I think it's a great testimony. Wow. The young people should be able to look at this, look at you as an inspiration to follow. Whoa. That's a whole, that's a whole book. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. The last time I was with you at your um, pastor's conference, you know, I mentioned that we should was have it, the... Was it the one we did, the denominations? No, the, oh. the, the one we did at the university. Yes. Yes. The, you, know, you know, okay, I come two times. The one with your pastors yes, alone yes. and the one that... No, yeah, I, but there was one with the pastors that we were talking about building a strong denomination. And there was th one. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. You know, I was proposing that we need to set up what I call the, the Archbishop Ajina Sari Fellowship Program. Okay. To be able to create the new breed of Ajina Saris. You know... And I think that is something that we need to consider and do. I think that we should be able to convert your experience into knowledge. And people should be able to come and study how to organize crusades, the Ajian Sari way. How to work in miracles, the Ajian Sari way. How to build, manage, and grow churches, the Ajian Sari way. Because you have done this. Usually you will find a very successful evangelist who runs successful crusades, but does not have a successful church. But you are running a very successful evangelistic campaign, have a successful church, and have a successful academic. This thing, you, you have Perez University, which is growing and expanding. So you are a very well-rounded minister of the gospel, and we need to be able to convert that experience into knowledge. Wow. Being the founder of a craft business school, I know when you talk like this, you, you know what you are saying. There's one of my sons in the Philippines, Bishop Maxwell Hagen, who runs, he, he runs Ajinasari Leadership Institute in the Philippines. Yeah. And it will surprise you to know that the, 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 the nation has accepted my book, Good Manners and Etiquette, to be used as one of its major courses to train their policemen. That's right. And every policeman that will have to graduate in the police force needs to do a course mm. on good manners and etiquette. Mm. And there are times I see the pictures, thousands of police people, yeah. and there's my banner, mm. Ajina Sare Leadership Institute, and good manners and etiquette courses. Uh, course. <laughs> I say, wow. Yeah, amazing. Uh, uh, you know, um, the, I, I think there are times in Ghana, we, we, we underrate some of the things that God has given us. But it's good that yeah. um, Accra Business School, at least you are, you, you are projecting what it must look like. Now, can you look into camera and tell a young man or woman out there what they should do? Uh, if, if they want to rise and do some of the things we've done? Well, I, I think that there are seven most important questions that every young person should be able to answer successfully. When you see people like the Archbishop uh, Ajina Sari, they have successfully answered these seven questions. I believe that life is an examination. And once you are able to answer these seven questions successfully, you will become successful. The first one is the provi providence question. Why did God create me? The greatest discovery you can ever have for yourself is the discovery of purpose. 
So it is actually a second question, the purpose question, and that is, where am I going? Life is a journey, and there's only one road that can lead you to that journey, and that road is Jesus. And if you want to really find the roadmap to success, that is Jesus. The next question is the personality question. How will my appearance, achievement, and my attitude affect my appeal? We just spoke about the Archbishop as in face of integrity. His appeal is based on these three things. And everybody's appeal is based on these three things. Your appearance, it determines your charm. Your achievement, it determines your accolades. And then your appearance, which is very crucial. So your appearance, your achievements, and your attitude is very crucial. You should be able to. Then the third or the fourth question, I think the third question is the prosperity no, the question. Fourth question. The fourth question is the prosperity question. What kind of financial behaviors would determine my financial success? I've had the Archbishop teach a lot on finances. And I believe that is where he is because he's cultivated a certain form of financial behaviors that has brought him here. And then the question about the fifth question or the sixth question fifth. is the people's question. The people's question. What kind of people do I need in my life? So you, he has built long-term relationships with very good and powerful and solid people which is very important. So let me leave you with these five questions at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I mean, you, you were almost taking us into the lecture hall. I, I <laughs> <laughs> and that is you. <laughs> oh, Bishop Gideon Titiofer, it's been a pleasure having you on time with Archbishop Charles. Thank you Thank you, Archbishop. Much Thank for you for making time me. to be God with us. God bless you. Amen. Thank you for having me. <laughs>